Our sermon title this morning is Your Voice in the Wilderness. Your Voice in the Wilderness. And we're looking here at John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. And today, coming to verse 19, we now begin uh, the narrative portion of John's gospel where we'll begin to see the prologue or the first 18 verses fleshed out now in the rest of John's writings here. So from verses 19, chapter one, verse 19, through chapter two, verse 11, we're gonna see an account now of the first week in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the seven days that began the earthly ministry of our Lord. In the first three days that we'll come to today, we'll begin to see John the Baptist giving testimony of Christ. In the next three days, we'll see Jesus Christ with his disciples and on the seventh day, we'll wrap up the first week uh, with the first miracle of Christ, turning the water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. So we enter in now to the first week of the earthly ministry of our Lord. And let's not forget now, as we get into these verses, John's purpose for writing them. We have to remind ourselves of this. In John chapter 20, in verse 31, John the evangelist says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And the truth is that although the way is narrow, which leads to life, and the way is difficult, which leads to life, such that few find it, many over the centuries have read the, jo the gospel of John, have heard testimony of Christ and have been saved. They've come to faith in Christ. And we must contend that this is the work of God, the power of God unto salvation by the spirit through the means of God's people preaching the gospel. Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And we're reminded that salvation, salvation for the Christian does not consist entirely in the notion that we choose him, but salvation consists in the fact that he has chosen us and has commissioned us to be witnesses for him to a lost and dying world. All Christians, small and great, all Christians, rich, poor, all Christians preach the gospel. All Christians are called to be evangelists. And that's why the church, at the beginning of the church age, and now down through the centuries, has grown. Christ has said in Matthew 16 that he will build his church. He is building his church even now. And that comes through the means that Christ has appointed, namely the preaching of the gospel by God's chosen means, preaching the gospel by God's people. Some churches don't grow through conversion. Some churches don't grow at all. And they can make whatever excuses they like, but churches don't grow because there's no evangelism. The Lord blesses his word, honors his word. The Lord blesses Christ, honors Christ. The Lord blesses the preaching of God's word. And where there is the preaching of God's word, the church will grow. Some churches only grow through sheep stealing. They take the sheep that were grown through the evangelistic of efforts of other churches. And they sit back and they say, look at how the Lord has blessed our growth. And yet there's no evangelism. They haven't done anything to win those people to the Lord. The Lord works through evangelism. He works through the evangelistic efforts of his people to build his church. And the Lord is doing that even now. Adolf Harnack, the church historian, speaking of the first three centuries of the church said this, we cannot hesitate to believe that the great mission of Christianity was in the reality that it was accomplished by means of informal missionaries. That's what you and I are. We're informal missionaries, informal missionaries to a lost dark world that needs a savior. We're called to be informal missionaries with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the early church grew at such an astounding rate. It happened as a result of the gospel, and it happened as a result of God's people going everywhere preaching the gospel. God blessed faithful evangelism, and that's exactly how the church is going to grow in our day. So as we look together at these opening verses in the narrative section now of John's gospel, we're going to see through the example of John the Baptist what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be learning followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
We're to be disciples. And we'll see what it means to be an informal missionary, to give testimony of Christ. That's our role. That's our responsibility. It's what we've been commissioned to do. May the Lord be pleased to bless our hearts that we would be consumed with a passion of telling others about our Lord. So let's take a look at verse 19. We're going to begin, point one on your notes, looking at John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, as he describes himself and is described by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. What was he crying out about? He's crying out about Christ. He's preaching that men and women would turn from their sin, turn back to the Lord, and he was preparing the way for the coming Messiah. He was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. But now John faced many things in that responsibility, faced many things in that role. He faced opposition. He faced temptation. He faced persecution. He faced questions about his own authority. He faced those that presumed they had authority over him. And we're gonna see that as we work through these verses together. First point on your notes, if we're going to follow the example of John to cry out for Christ in our own wilderness, your voice in our wilderness, so to speak, then we need to follow John's example in crying out in the face of opposition. John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, cried out in the face of opposition. Verse 19 says, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now, as we looked at in chapter one, verse six, John the Baptist was a man sent by God. He was a man sent by God to bear witness of the light. Now, as you would expect from John the Baptist, He's out in the wilderness doing exactly what God has commissioned him to do, what God has called him to do. And by this point in verse 19, he's already at the height of his ministry. He's working his way down the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance in preparation for the coming of Messiah. And the Messiah has already come. John the Baptist says, there's one among you whom you don't know. And that's true of the opening prologue. He came to his own people. His own people knew him not. They received him not. But the Messiah has already come. John has already baptized Jesus in the, in the river Jordan. And now, as John is preaching in the wilderness, Jesus Christ has been led away into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And so for the last six weeks, John the Baptist, while Jesus Christ is away being tempted in the wilderness, has been working down the river Jordan, preaching the gospel, preaching Christ. So verse 19 begins, this is the testimony of John. This is what John was teaching. Remember, testimony, that word testimony is a legal term. It's a legal term for a witness who gives verbal evidence of the truth to affirm something as true, okay? So if you're in court and you wanna affirm something as true, you call a witness to the stand and that witness gives testimony to the truth. He affirms that which is true. And that's what John is doing out here in the wilderness. And in chapter one here, we begin to see the testimony of John. Now, as we look at verses 19 specifically through 28 over the next two weeks, we're gonna see three different examples of John's testimony. Three diff different examples of John's testimony to three different groups of people over three consecutive days in John the Baptist's ministry. And it's described here in the next three sections of John the Evangelist gospel that runs through verse 51, okay? Three di different examples of John's testimony. Now, John the Baptist is not a quiet man. <laughs> He is not a hermit who went out into the wilderness to avoid the world, to hoard himself into a cave, uh, to be a monk. That's completely unbiblical. And John the Baptist is not one of those guys. He's not one of those guys, John the Baptist isn't. He's not one of those guys that would say, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. It's another unbiblical notion. It's always necessary to use words when you're gonna preach the gospel. I understand the point, but again, it's unbiblical. You need to use words. God has chosen the foolishness of verbal proclamation to save those who would believe. He's chosen the foolishness of preaching. It's necessary to use words. The gospel did not go out in power on the backs of people who tried to hunker themselves in a cave, live a holy life and avoid the world. The gospel went out in the power of the Spirit on the backs of genuine Christians who followed the example of John the Baptist and preached Christ. They preached the gospel. And this is not going to be some quiet, 
underground movement. From the very beginning, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness boldly proclaiming Christ. This is not a subversive underground movement. It grows. Christianity grows. The church is built on the backs of Christians in the power of the Spirit preaching Christ. Now John in the wilderness is the voice of one booming, the voice of one proclaiming, the voice of one preaching, the voice of one boao, crying out in the wilderness preaching Christ. And it's interesting to note that while John has been out here in the wilderness for the last six weeks preaching Christ, that Christ has been away in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And also, if you remember, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. The wilderness here has been called, described as the devastation. Before the children entered, the children of Israel entered the promised land, they were in the devastation. They were in the wilderness. They were in the abandonment. Also a word used for waste. Now get this, the wilderness here is a picture of the spiritual condition of the people. The wilderness here is a picture of the spiritual condition of this world in which we live. Is it any less a wilderness today than it was back then? No. In many cases, you can make the case that it's more so. It's more so a wilderness today. There is a wilderness that you and I live in. It's a wilderness of Orlando. It is a spiritual devastation. It's a spiritual, if you will, waste. That's because of sin. And he's here in the midst of this spiritual wasteland. If you picture John in the midst of this, this spiritual devastation, crying out, crying out in the wilderness for people to turn from their sin, to return to the Lord their God, to make way for the coming Messiah. Flee the wrath to come. It was a, a message of judgment. It was a message confronting sin. It was a message of the wrath to come. And he was compelling them, commanding them, crying out to them, flee to your only hope. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's giving testimony out here in the desert. He's giving testimony of Christ. And we too live in a spiritual wilderness. We live in a devastation all around us. And every Christian, in the same way that John the Baptist was called by God and sent by God to bear witness of the light, to give testimony, in the same way, every Christian is called by God to preach the living water in the drought. They're called by God to go out to the devastation, out to the wilderness, and preach the living bread of life in the famine. We're called to preach Christ. We're called to, with bold voices like John's, to cry out, boao, in the wilderness for Christ. And when you do that, is that a strategy for winning friends and influencing people? No. No, it's not. When you do that, what are you going to get? Persecution, you're gonna face opposition. It is a strategy for winning the lost. It's a strategy for winning brothers. It's a strategy for being an influence for the kingdom, but you're not gonna make many friends and influence people preaching the gospel. You're gonna face opposition. Paul says, yes, and all those that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. No, all those that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. <laughs> No, everyone who desires to live godly in this present age will suffer persecution. Jesus himself said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's every Christian. Now you have to ask yourself, you know, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm not suffering any persecution. You know what? I can't remember the last time I've suffered persecution. You have to ask yourself why. Paul has said all those that desire to live godly in this present age will suffer persecution. Jesus Christ, speaking of citizens of the kingdom, saying blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why are you not suffering persecution for Christ? Why not? I'd submit to you the why not is because you're not opening your mouth for Christ. If you evangelize, if you're faithful to preach as God has commissioned us to preach the gospel to lost people. If you go out in the wilderness that we live in and you preach Christ to lost people, you're going to face opposition. You're going to face persecution. If you face no opposition, you face no persecution. It's because you're not preaching. That's all that can be said about that. You're going to face persecution when you open your mouth and use your words. It's interesting that in verse 19, when it says there that John is giving testimony, 
That word for testimony in the Greek is martyria. That's where we get our English word martyr from. A martyr is one who has given his voice for Christ, and then after giving his voice for Christ, gives his life for Christ. All because of their testimony of Christ. You've heard of the magazine, The Voice of the Martyrs. Their voice crying out in the wilderness leads this wilderness of a world to take their life. John the Baptist certainly gave his voice, and he in turn gave his life for Christ. Charles Spurgeon said this, the good man has his enemies. He would not be like his Lord if he had not. If we were without enemies, we might fear that we were not the friends of God. Do you get that? If we were without enemies, we might fear that we were not the friends of God, for the friendship of the world is enmity to God. When the Bible says that all those that desire to live godly will face persecution and you face none, there's a reason. And it begs the question, why? It begs the question, why? I love this story about John Wesley. I think it's my favorite John Wesley story. But John Wesley persecuted everywhere that he went. He went from town to town to town to town, preaching the gospel. Everywhere that he went, he had eggs thrown at him, bricks thrown at him, tomatoes thrown at him, whatever piece of rotten food was at, you know, arm's length <laughs> thrown at him. And uh, John Wesley was riding along on his horse one day and he realized that it had been three days since he had been persecuted. He thought to himself, it's been three days and I've had no egg thrown at me, no tomato, no brick. And so immediately um, he stopped his horse, uh, slipped off his horse and said out loud, could it be that I am backslidden or I've sinned? And so kneeling there next to his horse, he knelt down to pray and he asked the Lord to show him if there was anything wrong in him spiritually. There was a man nearby who disliked Wesley he saw him kneeling in prayer, and so he picked up a brick, and he threw it at him, barely missing the preacher. And so Wesley saw the brick fly by his head, and he said, thank you, Lord. I know I still have your presence. <laughs> Love that story about John Wesley. True story. It's the cause for concern when we face no opposition. The gospel is going to engender opposition because this is a wicked world that we live in. This is a wilderness that we live in. So back to John the Baptist. John is literally in the wilderness, and he is spiritually in the wilderness, garnering a great deal of attention from his bold preaching about Christ. Multitudes are coming out to hear him. The Bible says that multitudes from Jerusalem, from Judea, all the region around the Jordan are all pouring out to hear John the Baptist preach and to be baptized by him. And so in drawing all these multitudes, what does John also inevitably draw? He draws opposition. Verse 19 says, the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And we need to set it straight right from the beginning. This was no friendly visit. The Jews, the priests and Levites, weren't coming out to thank John for his faithfulness to the Lord in preaching the gospel. Uh, this was an ominous foreshadowing of the persecution that is about to come. Priests and Levites came out from Jerusalem. Now, look at the contrast. John was a man sent by God. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 6. These, and priests, these priests and Levites were sent by the Jews. Now, the Jews, that phrase has many uses throughout the Scripture. Predominantly in John, it's used for those who opposed Christ, those that were the source of the opposition, those that were the source of persecution. Often refers to those that hated Christ, hated what he was doing. The phrase, the Jews, were for those that opposed him. Now, most likely here, the Jews were the Sanhedrin. There was a governing body over Israel called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a governing body controlled by the family of the high priest. So closely connected to the Jews, closely connected to the religious hierarchy, the religious elite of the day. And delegates from this body, delegates from the Sanhedrin would have been priests and Levites. Now, the priests were descendants from Aaron. They were the ones descended from Aaron that were charged with performing religious duties, religious ceremonies to the one true and living God of Israel on behalf of the people. That was the function of a priest. Now, there's no such thing as priests today. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our high priest. Amen. Jesus Christ is our high priest. There is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. We have no need for priests to mediate between us and God. We have Jesus Christ who mediates between us and God. So those that 
that call themselves priests today are not priests. They're just wicked men dressed up in silly clothes. They're not priests, okay? Priests have gone away. The other group that attended with these priests, attended the Inquisition, are the Levites. We have priests and Levites. Now, the Levites came from the same tribe. They came from Levi, but they weren't directly descended from Aaron. And so the Levites, being of the tribe of Levi, though, were given lowlier responsibility with temple worship, with tabernacle worship. Uh, these duties included singing, for one. There were 24 classes of singers represented by the Levites. Um, they were the doorkeepers in the temple. They helped some with the sacrifices. They would have, excuse me, read the law during synagogue services. But also, the Levites were the temple police force. And there were 24 classes or positions of policing that the Levites did for the Jewish theocracy. And so, as the priests, as the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin send out the priests to go examine John in the wilderness, do you think that the priests brought the singers with them? <laughs> no, no. They didn't bring the singers with them. They brought the temple police force. This is no friendly visit. The Levites, the police force, so to speak, go out with the priests to talk to John in the wilderness. This was a clear demonstration of power. It's a clear demonstration of them exercising the authority they thought they had and a clear demonstration of some latent hostility woven in there too. They weren't going to tolerate any upstart out in the woods preaching or starting a ministry that ran counter to their own. They weren't going to tolerate it. And incidentally, both of these groups, both the priests and the Levites, fell far short of a good reputation. If you remember, Jesus used both of those groups, the priests and the Levites, as examples of men that passed by the wounded man in Luke 10. That was the story of the Good Samaritan, right? They post, the, both of those groups just passed right by. And in Luke 14, now we've got these priests, these Levites, going out to confront John in the wilderness. Not a friendly visit. This is more like an inquisition. And it's a foreshadowing of what was to come. But now John was prepared for this. Jesus Christ was prepared for this. They knew exactly what was going to happen. In Luke chapter 14, this is to say that you and I should be prepared for the opposition too. You and I should be prepared for the persecution also. We know that it's going to come. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus Christ instructs those that would follow him to count the cost for being his disciple. Now, a significant part of the cost associated with being a disciple of Christ is the opposition that you're going to face when you open your mouth and cry out for Christ in a wilderness. You're going to face opposition. So what are you going to do? Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 14 to count the cost. You claim to be a Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian. You're here today. You're not saved. This is part of the cost of coming to Christ, part of the understanding of what it means to be a Christian. God, Jesus Christ, has commissioned his followers to preach his gospel to people who need a savior. What's the alternative? The alternative is hell. And people are lost and dying and going to hell every day. But Jesus Christ has called those whom he has redeemed to himself, those whom he has washed in his own blood, purchased with his own blood, saved, justified, caused God by his spirit to be born again. And God has caused those trophies of his grace to go out into the wilderness and preach the gospel. What are you going to do? Do you fear the, the opposition? The opposition is going to come. So don't let it silence your voice for Christ in our wilderness. You've been given a voice. Paul said, we believed, therefore we spoke. The Lord has filled you with his spirit. The Lord has given you a glorious inheritance. And Christ is precious. Are you going to let opposition silence your voice? John the Baptist didn't let it silence his. And so John, on two fronts, right? In one sense, he had great multitudes that were coming out to him. People that wanted to hear him preach. People that wanted to be baptized. Great multitudes coming out to hear him. And on the other side, great opposition. This was the opposition that was coming. And he knew he would face great opposition for his witness to Christ. Now, both of these circumstances, 
lead to temptation. And temptation in various ways. This is temptation that the Christian, every Christian, has to face. And every Christian, in the power of the Spirit, has to stare down this temptation in the same way that John the Baptist did and be courageous and not let it silence your voice for Christ. And we see this temptation woven into the fabric of the next three verses. Point two on your notes, crying out in the face of temptation. If you're a Christian, you're going to be crying out in the face of opposition, just like John. If you're a Christian, you're going to be crying out in the face of temptation, just like John. In verse 20, the Bible says, John confessed, and he did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him again, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Now the repetition, the repetition that you find in verse 20 simply serves to emphasize that John the Baptist, in the face of opposition, did not compromise. He didn't compromise his voice. He didn't compromise the truth. He didn't compromise Christ. He confessed. He did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. It means he clearly stated and he did not hedge his words. He gives a short, clear answer of five words in verse 20. And almost in this, um, what appears to be frustration, he shortens his answer each, each time. He confessed, did not deny, I am not the Christ. Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No. <laughs> From five words to three to one, uh, he is simply stating what he's been called to to preach. John was faithful to the Lord. And in being faithful to the Lord, he was faithful to the message that the Lord gave him to preach. So we see woven into the fabric here of these three verses, we see two primary temptations that John certainly had to face. And John continued, a voice crying out, he continued crying out in the face of temptation. One, considering the multitudes that came out to see John, considering the effectiveness, the impact that his ministry was having, the first temptation would have been the temptation to pride. Matthew says in chapter three that all Jerusalem, all Judea and the region around the Jordan were coming out to hear him preach and to be baptized by him. Luke three tells us that messianic expectations, expectations of the coming Messiah, the coming Christ, were running high throughout the region. And in Luke chapter three, verse 15, all of the people reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. So despite John's message, he was constantly trying to take the focus off of himself and put the focus on Christ, and the people constantly tried to put the focus back on him. They wondered in their hearts whether he was the Christ or not. John 10 says that many came out and many were believing as a result of John's testimony. The people, even this delegation from Jerusalem, wanted to attribute something of greatness to John the Baptist. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? It's just like in the same way those that wanted to take Christ by force and make him king. They wanted to attribute something of greatness to John. John was extremely effective. Yet in all this, John makes no claim of greatness for himself. And he humbly begins verse 20 by clearly stating what he is not. He is not the Christ. Now, John could have, knowing who they were, this brood of vipers who had come out of Jerusalem, knowing who they were, John could have responded in prideful indignation. Who do you think you are coming out here to question me, right? He could have responded, um, do you know who I am? <laughs> Attributing to himself his own level of greatness. He could have reveled in the attention a little. The fact that people were enjoying his preaching, coming out to hear him. Uh, he may have enjoyed being liked or enjoyed being followed. John might have thought of his own personal ambitions, might have thought of his own personal goals, the direction of this personal ministry that he was undertaking, the goals that he wanted to achieve. That was not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an object lesson in self-denial. And in being so self-debasing, John just kept pointing to Christ. While John decreased, Christ increased. And get this, while John denied himself continuously, he never denied Christ. The word here, confessed, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. This word doesn't simply mean a statement of fact. 
It wasn't that John just got out there in the wilderness, stood up and said, confess Jesus is the Christ. Like he was agreeing to a set of facts. Mere assent or mere agreement isn't nearly what is meant or communicated through this word. The word confess means to profess in a manner, to attest to in a manner that is observable through commitment and action. When you confessed something or someone, you followed that confession up with observable action, with observable commitment, with a vow or a promise, so to speak. You affirm a truth and you follow through with commitment to that truth. This was a, a vow, it was a commitment, it was a promise. And in confessing that he was not the Christ, John is just forgetting himself and confessing Christ, right? You could, could, you could clearly observe that in everything about John. John just forgot himself. He forgot his clothing. <laughs> Matthew says that he was out in the wilderness wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, a belt around his waist. John forgot creature comforts. He forgot his food. He was out there eating locusts and wild honey. He forgot his comfort, his creature comforts, in that he could have lived in Jerusalem and preached the gospel in Jerusalem, but he chose rather to go out into the wilderness in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy as one, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, living among the poorest of the land. He just forgot himself, but he never forgot Christ. This was not done in some form of asceticism where you punish yourself thinking that you're gonna gain favor with God. This was just John forgetting himself and living for Christ, came to the poorest, lived as the poorest of the day and preached Christ. Now, does this mean that you, you and I, in order to be pleasing to God, in order to, to you know, earn favor to God, that we've got to walk around eating bugs and, and uh, you know, living in burlap? <laughs> no. If you think that, you're missing the point. But listen, what is it? What is it in your life? What creature comfort, what leisure, what priority, what thing is it in your life that keeps you from denying yourself and living wholeheartedly for Christ, preaching his gospel to a lost world? What is it that keeps you from denying yourself, forgetting yourself to serve the Lord faithfully in evangelism? You know, people look at their schedule and it's, man, I don't have enough free time. And so I'm gonna take some free time for myself. For, do we need free time? Of course you do. Of course we do. The Lord gives rest as a blessing. But when that leisure time, when that pleasure time, when that free time takes priority over the commission that the Lord has given us to preach the gospel so that people can be saved, that's when that free time becomes sinful, a sinful priority, a sinful idolatry to you. Is it that you want to be liked? God, I don't want to preach the gospel to my family because I'm afraid of what they might think. You fear opposition. Paul says that if he pleases men, he's no longer a slave of Christ. You become a Christian and you, commissioned by God to open your mouth for Christ, begin to do so, you're going to face opposition. Oftentimes, that opposition will come from within the walls of your own house. What are you gonna do when that opposition comes? Because it will come. When you set out with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to follow the Lord, and your wife comes and stands in opposition to that calling. When your husband comes and stands in opposition to you obeying the Lord from the heart to do all that he intends for you to do. What are you gonna do when the opposition comes? What temptations keep you from being faithful? What personal ambitions? What personal interests, what goals, what likes, what dislikes? Are you thinking about that other person that's in a spiritual wasteland who needs to be saved? They're blind and dead in the wilderness. Listen, you have a voice. When the Lord saved you, he gave you his glorious gospel to preach. I'm always amazed at Paul. He, was a, he says, the testimony of himself, I was a violent man, an insolent man, proud, boastful. And yet the Lord was merciful to me. How was he merciful to Paul? Placing him into the ministry. And you and I have been given this glorious salvation, purchased by Christ, and then God sends us. God places us into the ministry. You have a voice, and if you use your voice, God will use it. His word doesn't return void. Be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. 
Don't be silent. Don't be silent. James Montgomery Boyce tells the story of a young man. He's a Christian convert in an African village um, with an extremely painful disease called elephantiasis. Elephantiasis. And elephantiasis is a disease which uh, affects uh, body tissues, affects the limbs. And um, this young man had elephantiasis. It affected his legs. Uh, the body tissues expand and harden. It becomes extremely painful and limbs just become enormous. Just um, where the, the elephant man syndrome, you've heard of that before. Well, this young man's uh, elephantiasis had affected his legs, it's to, such to the point that he could hardly walk. It was extremely painful to get around. Well, this young man, a uh, Christian in his village, went to every person in his village, walking, obviously, walking to every, every person in his village, preaching the gospel to them. Everywhere he went, painfully walking to preach the gospel to every person in his village. When he ran out of people in his village to share the gospel with, he started making the two mile hike to the next nearest village to preach the gospel to them. And he went every day, two miles from his village to the next closest village to preach the gospel to those villagers. And he worked his way every day through that village until he had no one else to talk to. When he had preached the gospel to everyone in that village, he started making the 12 mile hike through the jungle, leaving before daylight, often returning at midnight, to preach the gospel to everyone in that village. Very painful, and yet he just forgot himself in service to Christ. You know, in this, this day and age that we live in, with the comforts that we have, what do we give up, right? What are you willing to give up? You willing to give up that TV show? Willing to give up an hour of free time? I mean, what are you willing to give up? This young man just forgot himself in service to Christ. He not only gave up comfort, he endured pain. It's been said throughout church history that one of the leading factors to growth in the church and personal growth among Christians is persecution. When Christians face persecution, they themselves grow, but the church grows. We live in such a comfortable age, just overrun with leisure and pleasure. We need to be convicted by that. There's another temptation, though, that John would have faced. The second temptation that John would have faced would have come through uh, or at the hands of the opposition. That's a temptation to fear, a temptation to fear. The fact that John confessed and did not deny means that John was faithful to Christ in the face of growing opposition. To deny, to confess Christ, would have been for John the Baptist to deny his responsibility, to deny his role, to deny his commitment, to deny his vow, to deny Christ himself. But John the Baptist did not deny. He confessed, I'm not the Christ. And in the face of opposition, John just kept pointing away from himself and pointing lost people to Christ. So he remained faithful to his calling, faithful to who he was. And who he was, as we go through these verses, we're going to see, is becoming increasingly problematic. So these questions from the, the Jerusalem antagonists keep coming. And John's answers just get shorter and shorter. They asked him in verse 21, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Now let's unpack this for a moment. This is important. Elijah, for them to ask that question, it wasn't a bad association, all right? John not only had the demeanor of Elijah, he resembled Elijah. If you read about Elijah in 2 Kings, John dressed like Elijah. John ate the same food that Elijah ate. He probably smelled just like Elijah smelled being out in the wilderness. He had the same temperament that Elijah had. And just like Elijah, he lived out in the wilderness, a holy life, just confronted sin, preached about the coming judgment. And just like Elijah, you couldn't separate Elijah's life from his words. With John the Baptist, you couldn't separate his life from the message that he preached. He was a godly, godly man. Now listen to what God had spoken through Malachi the prophet in Malachi chapter four, verse five. Listen to this. In speaking about the coming of Christ, behold, God says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now in Jerusalem at this time, in the area around the Jordan where John the Baptist would have been preaching, again, messianic expectations were running high. And so the people were looking for Elijah to come. 
And Jesus himself said something very similar. Go with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Jesus Christ said something similar himself in Matthew chapter 17, beginning there quickly at verse 9. Now this is as Peter, James, and John were coming down the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus Christ was transfigured. They saw his glory on the mountain. And with Peter, James, and John on the mountain, we saw, they saw Christ and they saw Moses and Elijah. Okay, now they began to be a little confused about this, so they wanted to ask Jesus for clarification. And it begins in chapter 17, verse 9. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, and notice the future tense, Elijah is coming first, and will restore all things. Notice the future tense, right? Then in verse 12, but I say to you, now notice the past tense, that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Now, what does this all mean? Did Elijah cave to pressure or cave to temptation and lie when the delegation from Jerusalem asked him if he was Elijah the prophet? prophet? No. And we need to be reminded of this, that there are two comings or two advents of Christ. In Christ's first coming or his first advent, he came as the suffering servant, right? In his second advent, Christ will come as judge, executing judgment. So there is a near fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy in chapter 4, verse 5, and there is a far fulfillment. There is a now and not yet to this prophecy, all right? I want you to see that. Jesus when he says that Elijah has already come, is speaking of his first coming. In his first coming, Jesus clearly sees John the Baptist as a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. And even the angel, when he announced the birth of the coming birth of John the Baptist, Zacharias, his father, said in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, that John will come before Christ in the spirit and power of Elijah. So an Elijah-like figure, John the Baptist, came before Christ's first coming. But now, Jesus is speaking of his second coming in Matthew 17, when he explains that Elijah will be coming first. And you can see that fulfilled if you read uh, Revelation chapter 11, where Elijah comes back. This event obviously hasn't taken place yet. So in one sense, according to his first coming, Christ speaks truly about John, connecting him to Elijah. And according to Christ's second coming, John the Baptist speaks truly that he's not the actual Elijah that will eventually come. Does it make sense? It's a lot to take in. So they, those that were asking John from Jerusalem, asking John the question about whether or not he was Elijah, were asking in reference to end times. And so John answered rightly when he said, I am not Elijah. And he's basically saying to them, I am not the Elijah that you're expecting. But as Jesus said, he came in the power and the spirit of Elijah. Now, the delegation from Jerusalem also asked John if he was the prophet. This is the prophet that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Some people associate that with Christ. Some people associate that prophet with Moses himself. We don't know who that prophet is. We simply don't know. But why would this line of questioning potentially bring a temptation to fear? Well, how were the prophets generally treated? <laughs> yeah, not good. John had raised the hopes of the people, but in doing so, he raised the attention and the concern of the religious elite. And John and Jesus both knew what was coming. In the face of this coming persecution, did John falter? No. He's obedient, faithful to Christ. Just a few pages to the left. Go to Matthew chapter 23. John the Baptist and Jesus Christ both knew what this meant. Both faithful to the Lord in the proclamation of the gospel, despite opposition, despite persecution. And in Matthew chapter 23, this is how Jesus himself describes what had happened to the prophets in verse 29. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Now, was John the Baptist a prophet? Yes, he was. John the Baptist was a prophet. 
How were they saying their fathers treated the prophets? They killed them. But if we had lived back then, we wouldn't have killed the prophets. Uh, the verse 31, Jesus says, therefore, listen, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers. And it's interesting how he uses the same language that John the Baptist uses to confront them. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you the prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you, in order that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, Christ spoke these words in Matthew 23. John the Baptist was killed, is already dead, was beheaded in Matthew 14. Beheaded by Herod the Tetrarch. Killed by these Jews, this delegation, these people, persecuted for his voice. Listen, for, for fear of man or for fear of the kind of persecution that we face in this world in our day and age today, are you really gonna be silent? In the face of all that John, the example of John, the example of Christ, in face of the example of all those that have gone before us, Marturia, those martyrs that gave their testimony and gave their lives for Christ, are you going to cave in to the opposition that we face in our day and age? Jesus says, if you won't confess him before men, he won't confess you before the Father. We know what that word confess means, right? The Christian here is to take courage, take courage. Take courage through the example of John the Baptist. Take courage, because as Christ says, he is with you, even to the end of the age. We're to follow the example of John. We are to cry out in the wilderness in the face of opposition. We're to cry out in our wilderness in the face of temptation. We're not to shrink back in fear. Why? Why would we do that? One, because this world is a spiritual desert. It's a spiritual wasteland, a spiritual wilderness. And there are zombies walking around dead in their sins and trespasses who need a savior. People that need to be born again, made alive in Christ and given an inheritance in glory. They need to be saved. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Repent and believe in him alone. Put your faith and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. Be saved. But secondly, the reason that the Christian does this is because Christ is precious. Christ saved me. He saved you. And put the treasure of the gospel in a, an earthen vessel, a clay privy pot. Just amazing, isn't it? In the same way that, you know, Paul is amazed that look how wretched I was and yet God saved me and put me into the ministry. What unspeakable mercy. What unspeakable grace. And then are we going to be silent? The Puritan, uh, Thomas Vincent, wrote a book called The True Christian's Love to the Unseen Christ. I want you to listen to what Thomas Vincent said there. He says, if Christ has their love, their desires will be chiefly after him. Now listen, it's one thing you can't fake. If you're here today, you're wondering, have, has the Lord saved me? Has the Lord changed my heart? Has the Lord changed my affections? Has he changed my nature? Am I saved? You're thinking to yourself and you're examining yourself. You can't fake, you can't fake affection for Christ. You can't fake true love for Christ. Ask yourself this, examine yourself in light of this. If Christ has their love, their desires will be chiefly after him. Their delights will be chiefly in him. Their hopes and expectations will be chiefly for him. Their hatred, fear, grief, anger will be carried forth chiefly unto sin because it is offensive unto him. 
He knows that love will engage and employ for him all the powers and faculties of their souls. Their thoughts will be brought into captivity and obedience unto him. Their understandings will be employed in seeking and finding out his truths. He goes on, all their senses and the members of their bodies will be his servants. Their eyes will see for him. Their ears will hear for him. Their tongues will speak for him. Their hands will work for him. Their feet will walk for him. All their gifts and talents will be at his devotion and his service. If he has their love, they will be ready to do for him what he requires. They will suffer for him, whatever he calls them to. If they have much love for him, they will not think much of denying themselves, taking up his cross, and following him wherever he leads them. Do you love Christ? Do you love Christ? How faithfully is that love for Christ demonstrated in your witness for him? Do you love that lost person that needs a savior? How faithfully is that love demonstrated in your voice and going out as a messenger of the gospel to see that person saved? Let's follow the example of John the Baptist, amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this passage of scripture. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that you've saved us God, that you are so merciful. God, so gracious, so kind. Lord, that you would cleanse us, wash us. Lord, you would accept us as children of the kingdom. Sons, heirs, co-heirs with Christ. It's a glorious, glorious blessing. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've made us right with God. Not through a righteousness of our own, Lord, but by imputing your righteousness to us. And how, Lord, you've given us this glorious blessing. So out of love and gratefulness to you, out of great love for you, find us faithful, Lord, to be faithful with that message, to be a voice of one crying out in our wilderness of the mercies and the excellencies of Christ. For your glory, God, for your everlasting praise and worship, we pray all these things in the name of our blessed God and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.